Good morning, uh, everybody, and uh, again, thank you so much for being here so early. I know uh, for many of you, yesterday was a little late. Um, I'm, I hope you all had a good day and a good night. Um, we want to talk a little bit about um, how to make this industry, this medium, more inclusive and more just. Uh, and it's an important topic. I'm sure I don't have to explain to all of you like the feeling of not always being in the best place to be part of the games industry. Like Spain has an incredible games industry, but compared to being in the United States or in England, there are certain challenges that you have that they don't have. And that feeling is true for other groups of people as well. And we just want to talk about how to open up the games industry to as many people as possible. Uh, for that, I've got an incredible panel with me. Um, Kate Edwards, uh, a culturalization expert. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah Amale, who is uh, both a community manager and a voice actress. And Miriam LaChapelle, who is a producer on GameDev.World uh, and a producer and involved in numerous independent uh, community activities and Katie Scott, a senior game designer at EA. Um, we obviously have very different views on the games industry, and I think uh, the best way to kick this off is to just ask what kind of efforts you think are important, what kind of things you are focusing on in our industry to make it more inclusive. So I think we're just going to go okay. from Kate to Katie. Okay. Um. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Um, so basically, my perspective on this issue is it's, it's essentially the cornerstone of my career in the game industry for the past 26 years. Because as a geographer, I've been working in this industry doing this culturalization work. And essentially, what I do is I help game developers adapt their content to, to other cultures and make sure there's nothing in their content that's going to be problematic, um, that we're going to make sure the content meets local expectations as best as possible. Sometimes those local expectations are defined by the government, so they have rules about certain things you can or cannot show. But it's more than that. It's not just about like ratings boards and things like that. It's more about what what is the cultural mores and values of that of that local culture of that country, whatever you define it of that region. And can we make sure that the game content is being designed in a way that's going to be compatible? And so I want to make sure, essentially, when game developers are creating a, you know, they have their creative vision, they're doing what they're doing, um, that their vision is going to be as accessible to as many people in the world as possible. Um, I don't want game players, for example, to be going, you know, playing through a game and they're having a great time in like some massive RPG like Skyrim or whatever it might be, and all of a sudden they see a symbol or they see a gesture or they see someone clothed in a way that is relevant to their culture, and then that person or that symbol is being misused used or, or appropriated or somehow used in a way that is jarring to them and it basically knocks them out of the experience of, of having fun and being immersed in the world and that's what I try and avoid. So I help the game developers make sure that that doesn't happen and, and really I want to make sure everyone feels welcome in that environment, um, whatever culture they might be from. Now. In that process, of course, game developers, they have their own creative vision and they, they have a choice. They can always decide, I don't want to take that out. I don't want to change it. I don't care if it affects that culture or not. That's their decision and that's fine. I mean, they, they, they are the ones who own that and they are accountable to that. My job is to just make sure they're aware that this could be a potential problem and that if you leave that issue in there, whatever it might be, you're actually excluding people from the experience. And so I guess from my perspective, I take a very broad global perspective on this. I mean, yes, I dive into different cultures and, and the different issues in, in various regions, but my job basically is to make sure the content is can maximize its reach and go everywhere possible. And so that's the perspective I've taken on it. And you know, when I first started out doing this work at Microsoft back when I was there a long time ago, um, I first was using the argument that we're doing this because it's the right thing to do and that we want to respect our local customers and we want to respect who they are as people and as cultures. That argument didn't go anywhere yeah. with anybody. So eventually I basically had to monetize the argument <laughs> as you have to do with a lot of these things. So my advocacy in, in making sure the content was accessible had to be expressed in the fact that if you do this, your game will be accessible in more places around the world. Therefore, you maximize your revenue because you're going into more markets. And so when I use that argument, then, of course, a lot of the biz dev <laughs> people were like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Of course, we're going to do this. Um, but even then, it took us several really bad mistakes, very public mistakes for people to finally get on board and understand why this is important. Sarah? Me. Um, so, I, again, as a voice actor by trade, most of the, I guess, 
advocacy or kind of community building um, comes from there, or a lot of the work I do is there. So I'm also working with the Actors Union in America, um, SAG-AFTRA, to develop new contracts um, and to uh, support a different collaboration or to increase uh, and enhance collaboration between especially indies who don't often have access to voice actors or understand how to work with them um, so that there's new contracts for them. I'm doing more consulting with developers, especially indies, to understand how actors work and how to work best with them. So even within disciplines in the game community, I'm creating conversation and, and crossing, making a bridge where people don't are often isolated from each other. Um, so that's kind of close to home from the, the voice acting perspective. But then um, working with Indiecade, I've been an in event organizer and now awards um, uh, show host and director. Um, so making sure that all of these very different kinds of games, whole different genres of games are feeling included and part of the same community and celebrated properly for inspiring each other and kind of cross-pollinating with each other. And it was that experience working with Indiecade um, that I discovered a language barrier issue with one of our developers and, and was in, um, started talking to Rami about gamedev.world and that extra layer of diversity that is about language and culture. And, um, and it's true with voice actors too. It's not enough to just be included in an event that's not the same as being integrated into an event. And so it's not enough just uh, to say that someone's here, but is there genuine curiosity and interest and collaboration happening between these people? It's not enough just to kind of extend an invitation and leave it at that. So, um, so that kind of feeling and awareness expands across acting and other developers or other, or other disciplines in development and then also developers as a larger global community. And Indiegate is one of the, the larger independent games yes. events in, in the U.S. Yes. Uh, in, uh, there's three of them nowadays, There's right? three. There's Indiecade Europe, there's Indiecade East in New York, and there's Indiecade in Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, and uh, awards are open for anybody. Just yes. as, a, as a reminder for all of you, send your games <laughs> to Indiecade. Like it. Send your games to Indiecade, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Miriam. Hi. Wow, that's loud. Why am I so nervous? Okay. Um, so... I guess my work um, locally in Montreal, um, I've been involved with Game Workers Unite. Um, I've been learning about game rights and like labor's rights and trying to um, teach uh, game developers about their, uh, their rights um, as workers because as many of you probably knows, um, crunch is bad and um, <laughs> we work crazy hours. Um, and often um, people don't know about, um, like you can have vacation, like it's normal <laughs> to be sick sometimes and like you should not go to work when you're sick because yeah, you, you just destroy your health. So um, locally in Montreal I've been, uh, um, having a few campaigns um, to help uh, uh, developers, um, both indie and AAA, um, to know about like what, what, is, what is right for them and um, fight their bosses about it. <laughs> um, and I guess with um, gamedev.world that happened last weekend, um, a big, a big thing for me is like trying to um, spread knowledge from just like people from around the world to other people around the world, and trying to break the language barrier and like having people in their local town speaking their own language and having it. Uh, for those that doesn't know who what Game Dev World is, um, it's a free online uh, event that happened yeah, last weekend, and we were um, translate, live translating every single talk, the 30, 32, 30, 32, 35? 35. 35. 35. 35 uh, talk to eight different languages, so Arabic, Spanish, French, English, Russian, Russian Chinese, yeah. Japanese. 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 Um, yeah, yeah, so that was a lot of work, and I, I guess it I guess it was nice. I guess we 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 made it. Um, so yeah, I don't know what else do I do. I for, you're amazing. Yeah. For Game Workers Unite, one of the the common topics you you said you come across is that even though people have a lot of rights, they're usually just not aware. Yeah, they, they're of them. not aware. Like even me, I was like, oh wow, I I I. Yeah. 
I should be paid for my extra time when after 40 hours I should be paid for, for, my, for my time? Wow, I did not know that. Oh, That's crazy. one of the things I'm most excited about with the Actors Union is some of you may or may not know that the actors were on strike, the American actors were on strike um, asking for different working conditions, better working conditions. Um, and just in the year or two since then, the attitude toward labor rights in general has shifted dramatically, at least in the Western um, or the, in America, um, in game development, and now suddenly SAG-AFTRA is partnering and sort of advising. Yeah. They can't organize developers, but they can mm -hmm. share all of that knowledge and experience and kind of know-how, and I'm really excited to see that happening, so. Yeah, sharing, yeah. sharing knowledge sharing. is very important yeah. um, in, our, in our industry, I think. Like, we need, we need more um, transparency with, like, how much a game designer is paid. Like, um, I've been doing a bunch of talks at uh, students, like, in, in university, because, like, often, yeah. Especially like big AAA studios, they will like hire fresh out of school students at like super low rates because we don't know better. Like, I, like how much is a producer being paid or like whatever. So yeah, yeah we need to be more transparent about about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Just about everything. Getty, your perspective is obviously that of a of somebody who works in a large company machine, whatever you want to call it, organization. <laughs> um, what are your experiences in there? Like, what, what, do, you, what do you work on in there? Uh, yeah, so um, as you uh, mentioned, I'm a, a game designer, Electronic Arts, um, and I've had the opportunity to design a lot of games, I think uh, 10, 11 games with Electronic Arts, um, including the last four FIFAs. Um, and, you know, I, I consider myself a, to be a very typical game designer in that my role is to design features for people to have fun with. Um, you know, but in the last uh, five or six years or so, I sort of started noticing that I, that maybe as game designers we weren't doing our job as well as we could because um, we were very insular, we were very echo chambery, we were very focused on what we believed was the truth of the industry. Um, and so lately, I've been focused on trying to rally my game design community on a couple of concepts. Um, the first one being empathy, um, which is something that I talk a lot about, which is. Um, just the, the knowledge that your experiences and your opportunities and the things that you've, you've uh, you know, encountered in your life are completely different from what everybody else has. Um, and as game designers, our, if our number one goal is to bring joy to the world, which I believe it is through gaming, that we need to have extremely deep empathy with, with other people and think about other people and think about what they go through. Mm -hmm. Second being um, just challenging our assumptions, which I believe is also in line with empathy. Um, you know, I think as uh, humans, we're very, um, we have fragile egos and we all have confidence issues and we don't want to be wrong. Um, but we really need to make sure that what we are basing all of our decisions on is actually true. Um, and to give you some examples, you know, um, I believe that, um, maybe not in this room, but in many rooms that I've been in, if you ask what is the prototypical gamer, many would say um, younger Caucasian males, when in fact they're not the largest gaming demographic, actually not even by a long shot. There are many, many, many other larger gaming demographics, including women, over the age of 35 as being a larger gaming demographic than, than males. Um, third being the psychological safety to be wrong. So when we are pursuing this space, when we're pursuing um, you know, wanting to include more people, to understand their perspectives, to try and do a good job for them, that it has to be okay to get it wrong. Um, for example, I'm from Canada, and uh, we have indigenous people in Canada that can sometimes be called Indian people. Um, that is actually not a correct term because they're not from India, they're from Canada, and I believe that um, more accurate terms are something like native Canadians or indigenous Canadians. Um, but in my own design recently, I put the word Indian, um, and someone pointed that out to me, and it, what I, I was pleased to see how um, very little flack I got for it, because obviously my intention was not to get it wrong, but in fact to get it right. Um, and I think that the culture, at least at my company, the culture that I'm trying to spread is, is that it's okay to try things and your intentions are not going to be um, misconstrued. And so we've been working lately on um, lots of things at EA, particularly on FIFA, um, sort of developed a framework that EA is now using company-wide to help with uh, diversity within our games, mainly around uh, characters, you know, characters, heroes, and things like that, uh, looking at how we can do a better job with, with characters within our game. But we hope that we can sort of expand that um, over time, and that's something that we wanted to tackle first. But next would be accessibility, abled gaming, um, and then obviously um, attraction of um, more diverse uh, developers within our, within our industry. 
Yeah, uh, th I mean th that that touches on a on a on an important part of this. Uh, having different ideas, different perspectives, different histories in a room uh, is very important to making good choices. Right? Okay. It's not just a thing that we do because it's nice or it looks nice. It's because it makes better games, yeah. it makes better Absolutely. products, it makes yeah. mm -hmm. better industry, it makes a fairer industry. Mm -hmm. um, are there are there any initiatives or pushes that we're just going to do the opposite direction, I guess, <laughs> um, that you are involved in that you think are, are things that people in this audience could, could uh, learn from or, or implement things from? Like, obviously, having those three... Mm -hmm. um, the three examples is a very good example for people to look at their own studio, their own company, their own uh, projects and go, okay, well, here's some things we can improve. Uh, most of you here are, uh, I think, independent developers. Just raise your hand if you're <laughs> indie, just real quick. What are the um, AAA students? Ah. Cool. Cool. Nice. <laughs> okay. And all the other people that just <laughs> hang out? 10 a.m. in the morning? <laughs> cool. Just wandering. Um, <laughs> um, so for, for the people here, uh, aspiring game developers, uh, independent game developers, and any any tips for looking for diversity? I mean, yeah, I have so many, but I'll try to <laughs> keep it short. Um, so I would say the thing that actually has worked the most for me, and as you say, I work for a really, really big company. And in fact, I worked on what I would consider to be all the most uh, masculine titles <laughs> at EA. I have uh, uh, a Battlefield, I have Medal of Honor, Need for Speed, and Sports. Um, and what's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're like laughing. <laughs> um, um, I would say the thing that's helped me the most and actually gotten the most traction is using questions as a way to lead to mm -hmm. um, someone feeling like they're not being attacked for what they've done in, you know, it, with their decision making instead of being like, this character is crap, and I don't believe this character is authentic, and we need to do something with this. Instead, I would say, like, what have you done to ensure this character is authentic? And then if the answer is, well, nothing, they have that realization themselves. Mm. And I don't actually have to push uh, in, a, in a negative way. And I say, like, psychological safety, I think, being the number one, or not number one, that was my number three thing, but um, being um, something really, really important. So using questions as a way to educate has been a really, really soft and comfortable way to sort of pursue this, this area. Yeah. Miriam? Um, Wow, could be so many answers for this. Um, I feel like uh, what Katie pointed earlier about like having the space to be wrong is something very important. Like you learn, like if you want to be inclusive, you will just like you'll make mistake, yeah, you'll fail. Um, but I feel what one of the uh, most important thing is like accepting that you can make mistakes and accepting that you can be wrong and just learn from it. Um, Reading is also really important. Like every time I talk to uh, students, um, I guess I'm talking to a few of you now. Um, ask questions to like like senior developers, or like never never be shy to um, just ask questions. Like, hey, how how much money are you earning? And like mm -hmm. a after like how many years of experience? And like trying to have data on how the industry is doing right now because the industry changed so fast all the time. Like what was true last year is not true right now um, for most of it. Um, and like just always be curious about like the changes and like trying to understand where the industry is going. And um, yeah, I would say just always be curious, be like allow yourself to be wrong and learn from it. Um, like I, it's true for someone that's in the industry for like 20 years plus, or someone that's just entering, right? Um, and never, never be shy to be a butter to other people about like asking questions. Like, we all started at some point, and we were all, I don't know, naive mm -hmm. and very excited to be in the industry. And yeah, it just, just yeah, and be nice. Be nice. Be, be nice. nice. This is a good one. A good one. Yeah. Um, I think for me, there's this theme of curiosity, that it's that empathy comes out of a genuine belief that someone else has something interesting and exciting to share with you and to, and to add to your game. So I think, especially I saw a lot of students, like, be, be sensitive to the fact that great ideas for your game or great ideas for a game at all can kind of come from anywhere and come yeah. from anyone, yeah. whether that's on your team or the people in your life or people who do other kinds of things. Um, I think especially in university, 
you know, working with people in your theater department, working with people in architecture. Games contain all of these disciplines, which is what makes them so exciting. So be, see everyone and everywhere as a source for something that could be really exciting to you as, a, as an artist. And so I think that as a motivation keeps that, that impulse really clear and really exciting, and it's not just an obligation anymore. Um, so yeah, so people who do different kinds of work, people who come from different backgrounds, everyone plays games, so now your audience is very big and all the kinds of things you have to say will have an ear. So I think that coming from that place of curiosity is a really exciting way to engage with this initiative, I think, across the board. Mm. Uh, a couple of things that, that I would add just um, from two different angles. The first one is to recognize that every single one of us in this room is biased because we're human beings, therefore we have bias. We are born with it, we grow up with it, we are taught bias, we, are, we adopt bias based on where we're from, the culture, the geography, everything about it. I see bias all the time show up in game design, I show, see it in the hiring practices in the industry, I see it in all kinds of different manifestations, and the key is that we have to be very conscious of our own bias and really look in the mirror and really be introspective about you know, what, what do I have, what kind of beliefs do I hold that are holding me back from accepting this person or that person or that viewpoint that's allowing me to be open-minded about it, not only just in my game design and making sure, like for example, I have, I demonstrate better diversity and inclusion in my game characters if, it, if it, the narrative warrants that, um, but also in, in you know, the makeup of your company, the makeup of the people you hang out with, because all of that informs your creative energy. It's like when you surround yourself by diverse people, you definitely surround yourself with different viewpoints and all of that informs. I mean, for anyone who's an artist, for example, you probably Probably, if you went to school for art, you, learned, you took art history classes, like I did at one point back in my past. The whole point of art history classes was to show you the diversity of human art from across the entire globe and inform you on all these different styles that have taken place. Well, in the same way, we have to recognize the fact that we might have a set way of looking at things but that may not be the right way to look at things. That's why a lot of companies like Facebook and Google and others in, in the tech sector in the recent years have focused on the issue of unconscious bias in their company, in the hiring practices, because it's become a really big issue as it affects inclusion. The other part I would mention, um, more from an advocacy standpoint, kind of to the point about Game Work Unite and some of the labor issues, there is a sense of justice in this industry that is coming. And um, I think everybody who is going into this industry or is in it now needs to recognize that there is a wave of change that is inevitable. Um, I know whether it's you know, implemented by Game Workers Unite, whether it's other local uh, initiatives, whether it's the Legal Defense Fund that I'm trying to get off the ground for game developers, there is a sense that it's now time to change the way that we manage production. And so my advice is essentially, if you're in an indie company or even if you're in a larger company, just do the right thing. I mean, remember that evil triumphs when good people do nothing. So don't do nothing. Actually think about how you can be an agent of change no matter where you are. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That's, a, that's, that's one to continue from at 10 a.m. in the yeah, morning. How much time do we have left? Uh, Should we call it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just. Boop. Yep. Um, so, um, obviously, there, there are a lot of things that um, people can do when uh, they want to change things from their own. Is it, for, for the audience, if, they, if there's somebody in the audience that comes across something that is unjust or that is wrong or that they feel excluded by, um, are there any tips, any that you have for how to deal with that? Because it's a common problem, obviously. People run into these walls, whether they're women, whether they're um, non-white, whether they're uh, not straight, whether they're, you know, dealing, being a Spanish country in an English industry. There, there are ways people are excluded. What, what, do you, what do you recommend to do when you run into that? That's if you are feeling excluded yourself. If you are feeling excluded yourself, yeah. I asked for that clarification, now I knew that. <laughs> yeah, now, now comes the thing. Well, one, one thing I would say just briefly is, is learn to be constructively blunt. You should, you should say something. I mean, don't be silent. That's number one. But if you do, if you do speak up, make sure you're constructive, but be blunt. 
Be honest about how this is making you feel. Be honest about the effect of this on you or people you know, but you got to be constructive because most people, we hear negative feedback or we hear people calling us idiots or whatever on Twitter, wherever it might be. People don't listen to that. They're not going to listen to negative feedback, so you have to be constructive, saying, hey, I love your game, but here's some things that really bother me and I would recommend you do this instead and kind of give that kind of constructive feedback and people are much more apt to listen. I think that's the key thing is that no one wants to feel like they're not a nice person. It's a very uncomfortable feeling to feel that you've been raised, you, I, I, look, I've grown up this way, I'm consistent with this value system, how can you tell me I'm a terrible person? I know mm-hmm. myself to be nice or I know myself to be caring. And so then that delicate thing of saying, hey, look, actually, you may not have been able to see this, but this, if this behavior affects people in this way and I feel perhaps it might even be more consistent with your value of being nice if you add this layer to include people in your community more safely. Um, so being aware that many people do see themselves as nice and, are, and, and, and sort of allowing them to, to, um, to have that feeling um, and then to sort of find a way to work together to feel like you're on the same page, I think, is, the pl- is a place to start from. Um, give, uh, yeah, I mean, having good faith, I think, is a, big, is a big part of it. But again, but setting the boundary really clearly. Um, because the loss is, is cre- and I think I come back again to the right motivation for doing so. It's hu- human loss is creative loss. Human loss from the space is creative loss in your game. It's creative, it's a loss from your audience. And so what we lose when labor conditions are bad or when people are feeling excluded is games. We're losing games. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you care about games and you care about being inspired by games or making them or having them played, I think that's your, your the kind of purity of of why you try to extend yourself and put yourself into uncomfortable situations to include more people. I mean, like this, this is a long game. You know, we're yeah. at the beginning of this, this is the dawn of, of this recognition within our industry. And I think, you know, um, if you always stay on the side of what you know is right and what you know is gonna help other people, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna take your lumps. There's gonna be times when you're gonna sort of uh, softly confront someone about what they've said or what they've done and you're not gonna get the response that you want. And it may even lead to, uh, your career not doing what you, you want your career to do because people think of you as a shit disturber or someone who's constantly triggered or enraged or something, which is a fear that I have um, and I have had. And actually, Kate and I were speaking last night about uh, some things that sometimes occur in my workplace and I'll come into work and I'll be like, okay, today is going to be the day that you're not going to send a ranty email. <laughs> you're you're going to be... <laughs> quiet and you're going to be mature. And by lunchtime, I'm already like, like <laughs> writing it all down. Um, but because like, ultimately, I think you have to be real. You have to be yourself. You have to know what you believe is right and you have to pursue it. And it will turn out in the end um, because, you know, our journeys are obviously not like these amazing, um, what are they? I don't know what they call it in Spanish, but they call it lerp in English, you know, like here to here. And it feels really good. Mm. It's more like, mm, like that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I feel like for your point, Sarah, about like, um, um, I'm a bit tired, but um, about like losing games, like if if we, uh, like, um, I don't remember exactly what you Mm -hmm. said, but like I want to push further of like, it's important to fight for what we think is right because at the end, like, we're losing game, but we're also losing people making games. Like, I I think like the the longest, like the, Long as that someone is in the game industry is like what five years, yeah. Because people burned out. Yeah. People people get tired of 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 just overworking themselves. And um, I've been learning <laughs> by talking to students again that crunch start at school. Like they, mm-hmm. they they've been like overworked at school because like when you're a student you have to probably have a part time job and like going to class full time and then you have to learn from the industry because this is how, how the industry is like you have to do like 80 hours a week to yeah. make a game but like that's not true <laughs> it's false if you have a teacher telling you that you have to work 80 hours to make a game possible because you're passionate it's bullshit um, <laughs> um but yeah like most like if you want to fight you have to kind of like fight for yourself but also for your peers because like we're all in this together mm-hmm. like we all want to like have like a justice and like make the industry as a whole like better for everyone um like i know that the work that i'm doing right now with game workers and like i will probably not be the one that will benefit from it because i'm already like deep in the game industry and like i'm old <laughs> 
um, but I know that like all of my work will benefit like the next generation and like the generation after. So um, I, I feel like for, for me, like I, I'm not really fighting for myself. I'm fighting for like every, everyone else kind of thing. Um, but yeah, and I would I would say like when you you I think you you mentioned um, being blunt about like. Uh, mm. um, what you think is right. Um, as I, I gave that uh, advice to a few people uh, back in Montreal, but like if you want to go talk to your boss about something, um, always have paper trail of like what you've been talking about with with your with your um, manager or or other people. Or, like try to have a buddy with you in like uh, meetings um, because it's hard to fight by yourself. Like having a one-on-one -on -one fight with management. Um, but having someone that is with you that can uh, be accountable uh, for you and like helping you to like fight for like I don't know have free coffee or <laughs> <laughs> the most important be, fight yeah you know the most important <laughs> fight um, but always have like keep paper trails of like the meeting that you have with Roas and try to not be alone with them because like a lot of time when you have one on one with your boss they can try to gaslight you of being like, no, that never happened. I never told you that you would have a race or something. Um, so always try to, yeah, um, keep, keep, yeah, I don't know. Solidarity. Yeah. Solidarity, yeah, solidarity is, is, it helps uh, reinforce your courage. And this takes a lot of courage. It takes courage to speak out and it takes courage to receive correction. Um, in both directions, I think, and so so feeling that sense of community around you and 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 deepening your conviction about like I think that conviction comes before the courage. You have the courage on the basis of really believing this is important and true, no matter how many stumbles you take to get there. Um, so and and the best way to do that is to feel a sense of community and alliance with with your fellow creatives or your fellow teammates or other people who believe that this is um, an urgent thing to do. In, um, in, in your answers, I heard the words fight and, and courage mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, these are not easy things, as, as Miriam just okay. pointed out. Um, obviously, for a lot of people in the audience, uh, for myself like uh, and for all of you, uh, we want to do things right. Um, and, and Katie touched on that safety to, to be able to try things. Um, the, these are difficult things, and it's not always easy, it's not always going to go right. Is there any like encouragement you want to give people uh, before we, uh, we wrap up um, for why this matters uh, and, and, you know, for them to, to fight? Well, I, I think from my perspective, when I've given talks about the, related to these issues on, on advocacy issues, I often have used the term righteous rage in terms of <laughs> describing my feeling. It's not enough to be angry. A lot of us get angry about a lot of stuff. All you have to do is look on Twitter and, and find a bunch of angry people about all kinds of things. But anger without direction is worthless. Um, there's nothing wrong with anger, but anger needs to be focused. It needs to be focused in a direction of solution. And so that's why I use this term righteous rage, which, yeah, sometimes maybe that's not the right term to use, but it just resonates with me because I know that <laughs> I do believe that certain things are always right and always wrong. I think it's always wrong for a publisher to screw an indie in a contract. I think it's always wrong for management to force people to crunch ridiculous hours. I think it's wrong when companies purposely try not to be diverse and inclusive in their content and in their workplace. These things to me are always wrong. Wrong. And so I know that one part of the thing that drives me is kind of taking on this, this idea of being a creator advocate, not kind of like a warrior poet. You know, you're not just creating games, you're also advocating for, you know, a whole new future because games are the current evolution of human narrative. That's basically what you do right now. And I mean, it's not an insignificant thing. And so I think we take that seriously and we take on this idea that I'm not just a creator, I'm also a creator advocate and that I know that certain things that I'm doing are right, and there will be failures, there will be pushback, there will be criticism, there will be a lot of things that are gonna be difficult, but as long as you hold on to the notion that what you're fighting for is right, this is the right thing to do regardless, um, you know, it, it's basically, that's one of the things that helps me kind of stay afloat. And also along with that is being doing it collectively, as you mentioned before, doing it collectively is all important, because if you know you've got a whole bunch of people doing the right thing together, um, it, it's hard to not feel supported. Mm -hmm. 
It's so funny you say righteous rage because I feel like there's a real distinct split in my personality where I, for advocacy, I tend to be extremely soft and, and take everyone in the best possible faith and believe that they, we both have the same goal and we're just gonna talk it out and figure out how to get there. But then in games, I always play, I get cast for righteous rage. <laughs> so I feel like maybe I've just put that, that part of that feeling into games on this side and kept it separate. Um, like the Viking Raider is all about righteous rage in For Honor. But yeah, so, um, so that's funny. But I think that whatever, I do think there's room for both styles. I think that sometimes you need people to heal and to be patient, and sometimes you need people to rail and be firm. And so find, you know, find which one speaks to you that you feel more, comes to you more naturally. Pair with other people so that every, every context has the right person to do the job. So when someone says, hey, no, you're really, you are acting in bad faith, and I need a warrior now, that you have a warrior. And when someone is saying, I'm trying really hard, and I'm just making mistakes, and I'm feeling really isolated because no one's being patient with me, be that person. Yeah. So I really do think it takes all, all kinds of people mm -hmm. to, to move this forward, um, and different contexts call for different things. Um, but yeah, I think that's what I would say. And, and recognize the maturity of whatever entity you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So like, um, if your company or your school or wherever it is that you're working with is not super woke on this topic, you can start a little bit smaller. You can start with something that's maybe an easier change instead of just going straight for the throat because obviously all you're gonna get is pushback. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, starting small with like, as a collective and starting small and like, slowly building like the trust that collectively we can change stuff, but like asking for free coffee, by example. Um, and then, I don't know, like going further and was like, what about a raise for everyone? Um, that's, a, that's a really good point to like just start small and like just building on that. Um, I would say, I'm not sure if I'm answering your, your, your question wrong, uh, correctly, but um, I am, I'm very open to talk about mental health in game. Uh, we all don't take care of ourselves. Uh, <laughs> we're all bad at it. Like everyone in this room is bad at taking care of themselves. <laughs> um, I would say like fighting for like just being angry. Uh, it's very very tiring. Like you will get yeah. tired, and it yeah. like it's very important in those fights to n know about like how to take care of ourselves. Like. Yeah. You will get tired, you will get overwhelmed, you will get, like, you will cry and, like, be angry at yourself, at other people. Like, it's important to take a step back sometime and, like, letting other take the fight for you and just, like, just recharge and, like, read more about um, whatever the issue is. And the more, um, not relaxed, but the more um, um, rested that you are, the m better you can fight after that. Like, you can just, like, go back to your or something, just like fight again. And then someone else gonna take the rest and like just like step down a little bit and just rest and then go back and fight with you. Um, it's very important to take care of yourself. And, and talking about it attracts is how you attract people and to, to, to see each other and to feel that sense of community. So if you feel these things, start talking and you will find each other or pay attention to who's saying these things and connect with them um, because it, feeling seen is, is the first step to, to building that community that gives you the, the massive collective resource to do the good work. So y mm. Your question was sort of about uh, encouragement, right? Yeah. yeah. I would say um, just, you know, when I uh, sort of started on this journey, I couldn't have even imagined where it would take me. I think I mentioned last night as we were all, we all met that um, being involved in this space is actually a privilege. It's a privilege to uh, pioneer something that's never been done before. I think most people in their lives will not get the opportunity to change something for the better for humanity. So um, I really encourage you to get involved in this because I mean, it's just been such an amazing thing for me. I mean, the reason I'm sitting here on this stage in Barcelona, I'm Canadian, I've never been to Spain before, is because I decided I would get involved in this. Um, this, this topic is ripe for your involvement, especially if you actually don't feel underrepresented. I'm, I'm, I'm desperately waiting to you know, encounter someone who actually is on the side of this that um, is, is approaching it from, from empathy rather than own personal experience. And I think mm -hmm. those people um, especially can make this a really big deal. So I would say just, this is really fun and cool. Come with us. I mean, for all of you, just f from me personally, uh, this, our medium right now is probably the most important medium on the planet. 
And I don't know if you remember when you first started playing games, but there must be that one game or that one thing that connected with you, that made you feel like, oh, I can make this, I can do this, I can be part of this. And I think what all of us are talking about is to make sure that for everybody, there is that game. But then also when they look at our industry, that they see somebody that looks like them, that sounds like them, that thinks like them. So that not only they see the game and then have to wonder, can I be part of this? But they see the game and then take one look at the games industry and they know they can be part of this. Mm -hmm. So for the future, we'll have all types of games by all types of people. Mm -hmm. So to continue that, we have one more speaker um, and um, the speaker is going to give a presentation about a, a completely different vector, a different part of inclusivity and accessibility. Uh, Mick Donovan is going to give a presentation on his work uh, at Special Effects. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me okay? Uh, that was wonderful. It was uh, inspiring and reassuring. It was terrific. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, right, uh, I've got 15 minutes, uh, and I just want to give you uh, a little bit of a, a glimpse at what uh, 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 myself and my charity are doing currently to include uh, um, as many people as possible who have severe physical disabilities uh, uh, in, 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 in games. Uh, I'll... Um, uh, hopefully we can... Uh, is it OK to switch it through now? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, hopefully I'll get, uh, I'll get uh, uh, the slides there in a second. There we go. Yeah. Oh, great. Super. Um, yeah, it, it, it's everyone's turn to play. Um, and um, this is the, uh, myself and my colleagues. We're a, a mixed bunch. We've been talking about mixed bunch, uh, bunches, uh, uh, mixed diverse groups. We're, uh, there's a combination of people with a background in psychology, education, uh, uh, occupational therapy. Uh, there's, uh, there, there's, there's, uh, some, there are a couple of coders in there. So it's a very diverse group of people. And we're a specialist team um, uh, who are both carrying out assessments, but also uh, uh, we're doing a certain amount of technical work as well, hacking uh, uh, software as well as hardware. Uh, we provide lifelong support to individual people. They, it needs to be lifelong. Everyone with a severe physical disability, they will change physically. A lot of the people we work with have life-limiting conditions. Uh, and we want to keep them gaming as long as we possibly can uh, uh, through all of the stages which they'll go through. Um, games will change. Uh, ac uh, accessibility devices, that, uh, uh, access devices will change. Um, and. So we need to give lifelong support to keep people gaming at the best possible level they can. So every day there will be uh, 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 members of the team, here are two of our, uh, 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 these two occupational therapists, packing the equipment ready, uh, along with two other vehicles, ready to go to anywhere in the UK and sometimes beyond uh, to be able to support to provide ongoing support to more severe disability. These are some examples of the people that we work with. Elliot here, um, an unknown dis physical disability. Uh, he wanted to play Sonic All-Stars uh, Racing. Uh, Christian wanted to play FIFA. Charlotte, uh, she had, uh, and he had atherotoid cerebral palsy, severe involuntary movement. Um, Charlotte uh, lost her hands and feet uh, due to meningitis when she was three. Our work with her was part of that rehabilitation process. Uh, she's playing Angry Birds. Henry didn't want to play games at all. He was fed up with his older brother playing with, with his train set all the time. He's got cerebral palsy. He can only move his eyes. So we found him a way to use gaze control to be able to control his uh, train set. You'll see these in a second very briefly. Becky wanted to play, amongst other, other games, uh, uh, Mario and, and FIFA. Isaac, Assassin's Creed. Arlo, Sonic, and yet again, uh, uh, FIFA. Um, so, little video here, hopefully you'll be able to hear it as well. First time he'd ever played with his sister. And he enjoyed it when his sister went off the edge there as well. We were lucky enough to um, catch Christian at uh, the moment he scored a goal and I think he's using his chin to be able to control the players and the head switch, a couple of head switches at the back of his headrest there to be able to shoot and pass. A 
And that's Charlotte. We've got uh, a little dot that's being picked up, the movement of her arms being picked up by a receiver. You can see the little dot there. And here's Henry. We just set it up so he's able to start, go back. The fat controller can say something, uh, you know, to, to say, uh, to blow the whistle, that sort of thing. And away it goes. It was the first time he'd ever had any kind of control over anything, independently. Independently, sorry. Yep, this is just gaze tracking with Becky. We map the screen. We've got some open source software to map the screen for PC games. And that's one of our occupational therapists there working with her. And then uh, she wanted to play FIFA as well. Uh, so we set her up so that she was able to use um, two switches there. Uh, as well as gaze control to be able to play. Here's Isaac. Uh, he's unable to sit because it's so, so uncomfortable for him. Um, and we remapped the game uh, uh, via a PC so that he was able to play Assassin's Creed. And he plays it extremely well. And here's Arlo, he, um, his uh, oh, friends from school used to just come back home and play with his older brother in the garden instead of playing with him. Playing FIFA was his way of having something to play with, a way to make friends. And when he scores a goal, he's pretty happy about it as well. And he's sitting next to our occupational therapist and he high fives at the end here. Not easy. Um, okay, why? Uh, I'm a teacher by trade, worked in mainstream special, was deputy head back in the 80s. This is when computers were steam driven, uh, long before a lot of you were born. But I realized the potential of this technology for people with uh, severe physical disabilities. I then worked at a national assistive technology center, focusing on access to education and communication, your Steve Hawking type speech output devices, as well as access to education for people with complex physical disabilities. What I realized was, though, at the end of every assessment that, uh, where the parents uh, were involved and the, or the child was able to speak for themselves, uh, they would say, well, that's all, that's all very well, being able to, um, uh, uh, to access education, fantastic, and be able to communicate. But actually, what are they going to communicate about if they're not included uh, 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 in, in the if they don't have the ability to play? If they can't play against their brothers and sisters, what is there to actually banter about? Uh, um, so it was something that happened again and again and again. There was no, there was no specialist organization, certainly not in the UK, uh, uh, that would enable the child that you could say, right, go there, and they'll, they'll help your child to be able to play. Um, and it's not, so I, basically I uh, uh, started the charity 12 years ago with a view to doing what I could to try and redress uh, that balance and let more people with severe physical disabilities play. And it's not just me who feels strongly about this. Uh, um, this is uh, uh, United Nations Article 31. Every child has the right to play. And if you can't play, uh, you, these, these, you, these pe people I'm talking about, they can't you know, play football, they can't play netball, they can't cy cycle. It's really, really difficult for them to play independently at all. So uh, it is actually a fundamental right that we're, that we're doing our best to enable children, as well as grown-ups who have, have exactly the same need. That's what I found out. I started the charity with a specific focus of, of, of young people, but actually it's people of all ages that we work with, two to someone in their 80s. Yeah, but basically that's all very well for the UK. But, but the whole idea all along has been to learn by the, uh, from uh, uh, the work that we've done, learn from the needs of the people that we're working with, uh, so that uh, um, what we learned by creating specialised individual solutions uh, uh, were then able uh, to, to, to share uh, uh, with anyone who's interested uh, uh, across the world uh, uh, so that we can help as many people as possible. Uh, and it's wonderful that uh, we haven't gone out there. And uh, 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 What's wonderful is that all of these people have come to us uh, uh, and, and asked uh, 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 if we can collaborate in some way. Uh, um, just one example, Bryce Johnson, uh, inclusive leader at Microsoft, came to us to um, 
to, what, to be one of the organizations who are involved in developing the, uh, the adaptive controller, which some of you might have heard about. But it, it has made access to the Xbox significantly diff uh, more easy for many, many people across the globe. And we were lucky enough to be involved, one of the organizations involved in, in helping advise and develop it, as well as test it with the people that we work with. And for those of you who don't know, um, this is the advert one minute that, uh, that, that Xbox put out. I think during the Super Bowl, in fact, uh, just so had quite a response. My name is Grover. Sean. My name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen, and I am nine and a half years old. I only have one. <laughs> and, yeah. I love video games, my friends, my family, and again, video games. Whenever I play it, it makes me feel happy. The fun that you get to have with connecting with your friends. You make your own rules. It's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it. When I'm playing with a regular controller, there's some things that don't work for me. It's difficult for me to use both joysticks and the D-pad at the exact same time. And it just slowed me down a bunch more while other people were like... She's never had the freedom to play at the level she knows she could. I never thought it was unfair. I just thought, hey, this is the way it is and it's not going to change. What I like about the adaptive controller is that now everyone can play. I don't even have to look at the controller and just be like looking at the screen like, hey, yep, yep. You never want your kid to feel like an outsider or an other. One of the biggest fears early on is how will Owen be viewed by the other kids? <laughs> He's not different when he plays. It's a little challenging, but that's the whole point of gaming. I can hit the buttons just as fast as they can. And I think I can crush my friends. <laughs> no matter how your body is or how fast you are, you can play. It's a really good thing to have in this world. Yeah, uh, we try to make their, uh, we, tr we, we try to ensure that there are no barriers between, uh, you know, for, for, for developers who want to work with us. We don't, we don't uh, charge anything. Uh, they can take notice of us or not on the recommendations that, uh, that we make, you know, depending on their own range, huge range of considerations. And uh, uh, what, whatever intellectual property we have is anybody's uh, because we need to move quickly. And, uh, yeah, sorry, <coughs> uh, a bit tired, sorry. Uh, um, Ralph Fulton, for example, <coughs> is uh, fairly local to us in the UK uh, from Forza. He, uh, 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 as a result of the collaboration with him, uh, uh, the, the Forza 4 has uh, single joystick control. David Rutter, who I think we know very, very well, has been a, 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 a huge champion of our work. and. Uh, uh, he has a re just a few resu uh, uh, results of our, uh, uh, of, uh, 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 part, um, in part, perhaps, as a result of our involvement, has been that you can play matches on a level playing field, uh, si uh, such as sprinting, for example, with a joystick like Arlo there and just two buttons. Uh, you can also play online. Uh, which is huge, obviously, because the whole idea of, uh, of the work that we do is, 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 to be, is to be as inclusive as we possibly can uh, um, with this combination. And y uh, you can also control, Arlo can control menus independently, so you can play the game independently now and compete with anyone. Uh, Tim Schaefer, also uh, 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 a terrific supporter, uh, terrific collaborator. He's particularly interested in making his, his, his games are already very accessible, being point and click. But he was very keen on making the games gaze accessible, and uh, uh, the it's uh, the the uh, the uh, it's it's sorry it's 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 um, compatible with uh, um, Broken Age and Day of the Tentacle and. Uh, for gaze control, whether, whether somebody is using an assistive device, which is very expensive, or uh, I may, we may, made it work also with this, which is uh, a Toby 4C, which is uh, a device that fits on the base of your laptop, and um, it, it's about 150 euro, uh, which is significantly cheaper than uh, than, a, than an assistive one. So it's a mainstream one. Um, and uh, moving on, uh, uh, yeah, there's the menu that you can call up by using gaze tracking. Through developing free-to-play accessible software, 
That, this is partly to give fun to people around the world, enable them to play which, with using eye gaze, but also head movement, switches, etc. But it's also as a way, somewhere that developers can go to see, to see actually the kinds of considerations they need to make. It really isn't rocket science. Um, this is one of the games, one of the more dynamic games, but you can see that the way that we've designed it is so that um, it's just buttons, basically, and this is someone controlling it with their eyes. They look at the fire button there, and off it goes. Uh, it's just a bagatelle game, uh, um, but, but it hopefully it's something that a lot of people can play without having, to, having mouse control. They can just look at the button, you can look at the fire button there on the right there, I think. No, going down a little bit to move it, placing the button on the left. And then, when you're going to hit it, then look at the button. So it's a much way, easy way of playing it. Now, at the moment, you can't yet play online. The whole idea is you'll be able to play online uh, against whoever you want on the, around the planet, whether you're in intensive care and using gaze tracking, or whether you're on a mobile, uh, on a, a, a train uh, um, in, in Barcelona. Uh, um, everyone will be able to play everyone else. So the games that were put up there. I mine, uh, um, there's about 19 million people play Minecraft none of them, before we did this work, who, the most severely disabled people who, who, who use, uh, who can only move their eyes, uh, none of those could play. Uh, so we set about doing a little menu, sits underneath uh, Minecraft uh, to do this, to enable people like Tiago, who's got severe involuntary movement, to be able to play as well. that, um, uh, as I have got, uh, I'll, I'll speak for three minutes and then, then I'll be finished. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, it's available on GitHub, download. If you go to the web, our website, you'll, you'll find it. You'll be able to download it, install it. It sits along the side of it. Um, uh, so uh, finally, uh, training mater online training materials and information. We uh, do training videos. The whole idea is to get the information. We can't, we can't set up courses and, and set up special effects all around the world. We don't want to. We want to. Uh, collaborate with developers, do one-to-one -one work so that we actually know uh, and understand the work that we're doing and the technology that, uh, that we're trying to get, uh, uh, make the most of. We are, uh, uh, but also, w w it would, in this case, for example, it's a searchable blog, so if you filter by a single hand and um, then I think driving, then it'll take you to uh, um, the, those, uh, uh, the information and the vi training videos that that will tell you about those particular interests that you might have. So whether you're a person with a disability or you're uh, uh, um, someone who's supporting someone with a disability, it's a place to go to to, to learn about how you can, can help people using uh, 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 technology in the same way that, that we do our best to. Uh, there's a, there are training videos, this isn't a driving one, but you know, my, our occupational therapists, yeah, and that's good, the volume's fine. Uh, the, our occupational therapists do training vi videos, there are about 60 odd up there on a range of issues, and, uh, and this is just one of them. Uh, it was great uh, last year that, um, to have the, our area of work uh, um, <coughs> recognized, uh, and uh, uh, we had uh, the idea at Xbox 
uh, Gaming for Everyone Award uh, last year, which is great at GDC. And um, it, uh, all of the, we talk about comments on Twitter and et cetera and streams. Uh, I always look at sort of, I peep from behind the sofa when I'm looking at any about myself, but it was wonderful to see that, uh, uh, that all of the comments on the stream that I looked at afterwards were positive. This one was slightly baffling, but um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to take. <laughs> I'll do, I'll do my best to take it as a compliment. Um, and finally, I'm just going to show you yet again one minute video. Uh, we put this out at the beginning of this week, correspond with me coming here. Uh, uh, and it's, it's had about 48.1K views. If you, if you guys are interested, you know, look at Special Effect Twitter account. And if you want to retweet it, we might beat the 50,000 by, by the end of the week. But I say, I'll finish off now. This is uh, it's just one minute of your time. Thank you. Nobody likes being left out. That's why Special Effect are helping people with physical disabilities to play video games. But this isn't just about having fun. The gaming setups we create are personalized, so people can play to the very best of their abilities. And that opens the door to inclusion and independence, confidence and creativity. Help us level the playing field and create more magical gaming moments because it's everyone's turn to play. <laughs> yeah, thank, you. thank you very much indeed, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Th thank you so much, Mick. And, and one last call regarding all this that you have seen. Um, you do like uh, one special effect day every day, every year, right, Mick? Yeah. So um, yeah. So and 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 if you as developers want to cooperate and to collaborate and to help uh, a special effect, you can get in touch with them and see how you can. You can help them, and there, are, there is a lot of work. I've been there last last year, and it's an, they have an amazing team, and they're doing a, a very, very awesome job. So, congratulations once again. <laughs> to close, plan. On uh, well, hello. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on my end, I want to thank all the panelists: uh, Mick, Katie, Miriam, Sarah, uh, Kate. Uh, if anybody has any questions for some of us, some of us will be. Up there, outside of the room, we have to make space for the next talk. If you have any questions, any problems you're facing, anything you want to know about, uh, you can ask the one of us that are uh, up there. Uh, if people want to reach you real quick, uh, is there any place to reach you, Kate? Um, I'm Geography, G-E-O-G-R-I-F-Y on Twitter. Sarah? I'm on Twitter at S uh, Selmale, so S-E-L-M-A-L-E-H. Yeah, Mill Mil Pilgrim, M-L-L-E Pilgrim on Twitter as well. I'm doing a talk today at four. You can come <laughs> talk to me. <laughs> and if you want to reach me, I'm THA underscore Rami on Twitter, and I'll also be upstairs answering questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being, thank for being you. here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.